can while we're on that topic, can you just for the my listeners who haven't heard of Freud's Free Clinic, can you kind of um, outline the book a little bit for us? Oh, sure, my pleasure. Well, the subtitle of the book is uh, Psychoanalysis and Social Justice, 1918-1938. Hmm. Uh, so the book is um, 20 chapters, uh, one per year. Oh. Um, and it's... Uh, uh, the... It's all based on, frankly, my own research into primary uh, sources, scouring primary sources everywhere from, um, I mean, for New York, the Library of Congress, um, uh, the London, um, the British Psychoanalytic Society, um, Germany and uh, Koblenz, a lot of research in Vienna in Austria, and mm. fortunately also a lot of oral history interviews oh. um, on uh, what actually happened. My first interview was um, was with Elsa Pappenheim, who, who escaped. Many of them were Jewish, and many oh. of them had to escape. And I said, what is this that I hear about free clinics? I mean, I knew they existed. <laughs> and she said, I mean, she was born in Austria and, um, you know, had gone to medical school there before she had to leave. And she said, well, of course. She said, all the doctors, all, all the medical professions had clinics, so why shouldn't the psychoanalysts have one too? <laughs> and um, so it sort of it just uh, built and built and built. Uh, and then because I'm a social worker, um, so I I'm not a historian and I'm not a psychoanalyst. I right. Uh, so again, the the sort of uh, core of social work is person and environment. Uh, so um so it's not only that the clinics existed but what was the overall overall environment what was the uh politics of the era what made it possible what made it difficult uh. so forth and that's what when i started to find the history of interwar vienna uh which with the collapse of empire saw the social democrats win the first free elections mm -hmm. and the first elections period in austria um and so that led to this huge upsurge of uh cultural and intellectual production and amazing advances in medicine mm -hmm. um of which psychoanalysis was part um so what's interesting is that it, in many ways, it parallels the history of Weimar Germany of the same era, but uh, it because Austria is so small and I, I don't know, for many different reasons, it had really basically been ignored. Mm -hmm. um, there were very few books about it. So again, I had to do a, a lot of investigation. Wow. Again, that led me back to Austria, um, um, yeah, after I left the university, I ended up moving there for seven years. Oh, wow. back to New York two years ago. Oh. Um, and um, yeah, because, you know, and also looking at the, like the relationship between London and Berlin and Barbara Lowe had gone from one who was a British psychoanalyst from London to visit the analysts at the Institute in Berlin and took the news back and said, we should really have a free clinic. Mm -hmm. And so it grew in that way, but it was very, also very much linked to uh, what was possible socially and politically. Uh -huh. um, and then I started finding out that the some of the Viennese analysts were in fact so politically involved 
that they were members of the city council uh. and that in turn influenced the acceptance of the clinics. And then I started looking through newspapers because in public history, that's what you do. Uh-huh. And um, I found that psychoanalysis was widely accepted in the everyday urban press. And there were loads of articles about it and so forth. And then later, as I started m- moving further back into the work of Anna Freud, I found the announcements of all of her clinics in various oh. parts of Vienna and so forth. Wow. How many years did that take you? Oh, I don't know. Um, I mean, I I guess I got, um, I, I, I wrote a sketch of this uh-huh. uh, for my dissertation, which was years ago in 1996 that's when i got my doctorate oh. and then um i started going deeper into a couple of the clinics and publishing the articles and i guess the book came out in in 05 hmm. so it took me a while you know i was working full time i was a professor so oh okay now um yeah there a very full time cuz You know, the city university, it's the public university. People are very engaged. Oh, yeah. Um, Yeah. Wow. Is, uh, other than, so your initial kind of mind-blown moment was, wow, there were free clinics, like, I need to look into this. Once you started looking into it and you're able to interview people like that, uh, was there anything that popped out? What was, like, what's what popped out to you more? uh, like again, that was like, wow, how did how did we not know this or any any yeah, that's a good question because people to whom I spoke about this, and you know, it's all data driven. I mean huh. the research is there. Yeah. So you can quarrel with my interpretation, but not my research. Yeah. If you want to quarrel with the research, you have to do it. Yeah. Yeah, you know. And, um, but the question was always does that how, why did we never know about this? Hmm. Why, um, why had this sort of, um, false narrative been able to, um, take hold? So, um, there are a couple of reasons, and I, I wrote, I wrote another paper about this, but, um, because of the uh, Nazi Anschluss, the joining in mm. uh, in thirty eight, as you know, the the um, you know being Jewish was essentially a death sentence, and um, most of the psychoanalysts were Jewish, and um, so uh, they had to flee, um, but they weren't so welcome (laughs) right um and not some went were able to get to the uk but in the us um the notorious quote land of the free uh we had um uh, j edgar hoover as gatekeeper this was you know as mccarthyism was already growing and and j edgar Hoover was there, and he was the epitome of um, what today we call Christian nationalism. And um, he hated. He heard about the psychoanalysts and uh, labeled them communist, queer, and mentally twisted. <laughs> wow! And so there's this whole history of um, of Hoover's persecution surveillance and persecution of the analysts who indeed did have these left-wing backgrounds hmm. did not were did not object to homosexuality hmm. were Jewish and also largely atheist <laughs> um I mean everything that Hoover absolutely loathed yeah. 
and you know he was on this moral crusade and um and he essentially uh terrorized the community uh and so all of that went underground hmm. there were things they could not talk about if they had to survive they couldn't talk about it uh -huh. They did, many of the analysts, when they they did find <laughs> uh, jobs largely in the social service communities. So the social work agencies, um, like, um, oh, in so really all over the country actually yeah. housed them. And then they set up their own uh, institutes, and so forth. So okay. by at a certain point, um, you know, there was this huge question about whether they were medical or not. They weren't really. But anyway, so yeah, so the history was repressed. They repressed it to save their skins, basically. Hmm. Okay, yeah. You know, it's interesting. Um if I can comment on a few things, uh, one you talked about, you started looking into okay, as a social worker, uh, it's about environment, like the political landscape and person. And it makes a lot more sense to know like how you said, I think her name was Oppenheimer that you, that you interviewed. And she said, well, the, Oppenheim. she said, well, yeah, the, the doctors, they all had free clinics. Why would the psychoanalyst not have them too? And there's a there's a quote that you it's, it's a speech that Freud was giving uh, in I think 1918 right. the, and he said uh, the poor man should have just as much right to assistance for his mind as he now has to the life saving help offered by surgery and I was like well that I mean that makes sense like especially if if Freud you know psychoanalysis was a science and you had people who if you think of Freud's to love and to work, yeah. and you have people who are unable to work because of their uh, mental functioning, then why would society not invest in their health care just as much as they would someone who's not able to work because of a broken limb or something? Exactly. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so part of that is the um, is the is the belief in social democracy. I mean, he was a social democrat. Hmm. And, you know, Vienna had been devastated by the war. And so to rebuild the city and actually the nation, you had to have a healthy population. Hmm. Um, and so a lot of what we have today actually comes from that era 